Okay, so today we're going to examine a set of objections to Kantian ethics. Just to remind ourselves what Kantian ethics says in a nutshell, in a very, very small nutshell. Um, Kantian ethics says that, you know, there's one, only one motivation uh, to be moral, which is the goodwill, which is essentially your kind of willingness to obey your duty, which is an absolute form of duty. Then he comes up, Kant comes up with two kind of categorical imperatives, two rules for action. One is universalization, which says that any maxim, so proposed rule that you're going to kind of implement work by, needs to be capable of being uh, followed by everybody. That's what universalization means without contradiction, without it making itself false. If it is, then it's fine. If it isn't capable of universalization, then it's wrong. The other is respect for autonomy. Autonomy being free choice. And free choice is kind of the centerpiece of Kantian ethics. It's the, it's the ground rock of what actually makes something good or bad in the first place. The origin of ethics, the ability to choose. And so you need to respect the freedom of choice, not just for yourself, but for everybody else. We're going to look at three objections to uh, this ethical theory today. We're going to start by looking at probably the most famous of the objections, the murderer at the door objection. So the murderer at the door objection proposed um, originally by Benjamin Constant is this. Here's your house. You are in your house, as you often are, I assume when there's a knocking at the door. Someone is very, very worried and they want in. So, being a good and concerned citizen, you allow them in and you tell them, don't worry, go and hide. Hide under the, uh, uh, behind the sofa over there. Another knock at the door. This time, from an axe murderer. An axe murderer with a white beard. Possibly an off-duty Father Christmas. So this axe murderer wants to know where your friend is. Well, you have a problem here, don't you? Because, of course, Kantian ethics... Kantian ethics says stuff like, don't lie. Why don't lie? Well, it undermines... It is broken by universalization because if everybody lied, then no one would know who was telling the truth, and so lying would be completely ineffectual, so it would be wrong. It also breaks autonomy because you're breaking the autonomy of the axe murderer, who should be free to choose things. So what do you do? Well, you open the door and you say, hey, he's, he's over there, he's behind the sofa. So Kantian ethics kind of strict rules so the objection goes, Kantian ethics strict rules commit us to bad action. For instance, helping an axe murderer uh, find your friend, because you must not lie. Now, obviously, that's kind of against the whole ethics thing, which is why... It's an objection to Kantian ethics. But there is a response. This is a response that's often given along these lines, which is essentially this, that obviously telling a murderer where your friend is is bad, okay? Don't do that. Uh, rule for life. Um, but there's a difference. So there's a difference between... these two things. Telling the truth, which is kind of the situation you're faced with here and you think that kind of Kantian ethics forces you into, as opposed to not lying. And actually Kantian ethics commits you to this one. So you can do this, 
but not tell him where the friend is. You don't have to do this bit, right? You can instead close the door, um, for instance. So Kant says that this one is the one you'd actually have to do. I'll leave it up to you to, th to decide whether that's a good reply to that objection or not. Let's move on to the next objection. This comes from John Stuart Mill. Now, John Stuart Mill, who's a utilitarian philosopher, who, who's, whose thought uh, was that the thing that makes something good or bad is the amount of happiness or, or, sad, or pain produced as a result. So he, he takes a very different view of ethics. But at the beginning of his book um, on utilitarianism, he criticises Kantian ethics. And he says that the categorical imperative leads to bad maxims. Remember, a maxim is a proposed rule. So he's thinking of this, the first statement of the categorical imperative. If you universalise it and it's contradictory, then it's wrong. But Mill says, there's loads of things that I can universalise that aren't contradictory, but seem pretty wrong, right? So he gives us kind of two examples. One example is steal when you can. Okay, so maybe stealing as an absolute thing would be wrong because then there's no concept of property. But still, when you can, that doesn't break property. That isn't contradictory and therefore would pass. Here's another example, running out of space down here. Uh, my first speech bubble was both very nice and a bit too, uh, a bit too uh, tall. Uh, how about this, says Cam, it uh, says Mill. Kill, when it isn't risky. It's actually very rare to be in a situation when you can kill without it being risky. So it's not like if everyone followed this, there would be no one left in the world. Just a few people would die. He says, look, both of these pass the universalization test. They're, but they're bad. They're wrong, so there must be something wrong with the universalization test. A response to this one comes from Honora O'Neill. Now, O'Neill argues that actually, yes, that passes the first test. These pass the first test. So the first categorical imperative. I'll just write first cat. But and this is a big but, not the second. The second categorical imperative is all about autonomy, respecting people's autonomy. Killing them, that's not respecting their autonomy. Nor is stealing whenever you can. Equally, not respecting their autonomy. So, Kant wouldn't think that these pass his categorical imperatives. Only the first one. There's a reason why the second one is there. Again, I'll leave it up to you to, think, to decide whether that's a good reply or a bad reply. We're going to move on to the third and final objection that we're going to consider today. Now, this is a slightly different one. Often it's put as uh, the objection that, you know, Kantian ethics is too logical. I want to reframe that slightly. I want to say that moral decision-making is fundamentally, as a practice, emotional, not rational. So it's about emotional reasoning. Ethics is an emotional system. It isn't a reason-based system. It isn't about logic. Kant, remember, thinks that fundamentally morality is about the application of logic. He takes emotion entirely out of it. But what if the way that we actually behave is in a, an emotional sense, not a rational sense. The uh, philosopher and neuroscientist Joshua Green uh, gave um, his uh, group of subjects 
uh, something uh, that we know in philosophy as the trolley problem. It's been around uh, for about 60 years now, but Joshua Green applied it to a group of candidates. He said, I want you to imagine a scenario where you are in control. This is, this is you down here. You're in control of a runaway train. This runaway train is currently going to run over one, two, three, four, five people. But you could move a lever and send it down this track. You'd save these five and kill just one. That's a rational question, okay? Now, I don't need you to think about it for very long for you to know what you would do, right? You would send it down here to kill just the one. Kant, by the way, probably wouldn't, because that is a positive action as opposed to doing nothing. So that's active murder as opposed to just being a bystander. But we're using our reason here. It is a rational question because we are fundamentally detached from it. Joshua Green gave them a second version. This is the second version. There are five people, again, on the track over here. Here's the runaway train and it's going to go along here. But you, this time, you're up here on a bridge next to a fat man. What you could do is you could push the fat man off. He lands on the track and slows down the train. The train doesn't kill these five people. Only one person dies. So this first one is one versus five. This second one is also one versus five. On a logical basis, it's the same question, but I wonder whether you have the same answer. You might well feel a little bit queasy about killing that one fat man, because you have to get your hands on him. You're reacting in an emotional way. Well, Joshua Green put his uh, people in a brain scanner, which I've taken way too long to draw, but I am very proud of it. So, <laughs> he, put the, he put his people in a brain scanner um, to measure their responses to these two different, but pretty similar, questions. And he got two different results. He found that those who looked at issue one over here, which is this one, the classic trolley problem, well, they responded with their rational brain, the rational part of their brain. The same part that you use to kind of solve abstract problems, because you're not really engaged in it. Whereas those who were presented with this second example, they here responded with their emotional and empathetic brain. The parts that are responsible for empathy in the brain, they lit up. Now what's the importance here? The importance is that this is much more realistic than this. When you think about moral situations in your own life, you are presented with real people that you have to interact with. It is a tactile experience. It is a real physical experience. Passing someone who's asking for food in the street is not an abstract problem, it is a real issue. Deciding whether to lie to your friend or to tell them the truth is not an abstract problem, it is a real issue. And when we deal with these real issues, we're dealing, using, according to Joshua Green, our emotional brain. Morality, we could argue, is emotional. So Kant would then be wrong to call it logical. Ooh. And that is the third criticism of Kantian ethics.